my name is Connor, and I have been watching your videos since early 2019. I've wanted to send you these experiences for a while, but I haven't had the chance to do so until now. Before I begin, I can attest that everything in this account is 100% true. This story comes in two parts. The first incident is more of a paranormal experience, while the second one has had a few news articles written about it, which I'll link below. At the time, I didn't think these two experiences were connected, until about a year after they happened. I came to this revelation while watching videos on people's encounters with the men in black. Only then did it click in my mind that these two separate experiences may be related. I grew up in a small beachside town in Long Island, New York, about a two-hour drive away from the Big Apple. If you didn't already know, most of New York State is rural and gets very warm during the summers. Many people I have talked to that have never been here wrongfully assume that the state is entirely made up of the city and is freezing for most of the year. We get a lot of tourism in the summer, as people really like the beaches and scenery on Long Island. Our town holds a big festival where vendors from all over come to sell things on the streets. If you walk up my street, which would typically take you about three to five minutes, you would end up in the village where all the stores are. At the end of my street is an old cemetery surrounded by a forest. As a kid, my friends and I used to play flashlight tag in there at night, around Halloween. Behind the cemetery is a massive dune. During the winter months, when it snowed, all the kids from around town would go sledding there. If you walked all the way down my road to the cemetery, then turn left, once the cemetery ends, the road turns from a regular paved road to a dirt and gravel one, which straddles the forest and eventually leads to a dead end. However, beyond where the road ends is a small railroad station that I used to ride on when I was little. On Halloween night, a train was decorated with scary props, and we would always take a ride around the island before trick-or-treating. As you can probably tell, this area holds a lot of great childhood memories for me. Unfortunately, they stopped doing the train rides around 2012, and the dune has become filled with trash. During the summer, people would go there and drink and hang out, and left the place in ruins. As an adult... I still like taking walks back there, as it is close to where I live now, and it's still very peaceful, as no one really goes down there anymore. It was June of 2014. I was 15 years old back then. My town was having that big festival I mentioned earlier, and it was down the road from my house. So instead of going straight home that day, I decided to keep walking the rest of the way down my road toward the forest. When I neared the entrance to the cemetery, I made a left down the dirt road, heading toward the abandoned train station. I noticed a Hummer and a minivan parked at the end of the road. They stuck out like a sore thumb. I had seen cars parked down here before, when given no other choice, but it wasn't really all that common. As I passed by the cars, I changed my mind about going to the train station. When I turned around to start heading back, Something caught my eye. I saw a family of about 12 people, possibly more, coming out of the forest and making their way to the vehicles that were parked on the side of the road. But that's not what I was focusing on. There were two figures making their way through the crowd of people. Upon seeing them, a feeling of dread overcame me. I could tell that something about these figures was unnatural. I know that's a common trope that people say, being repulsed by a negative aura, but it's something that does happen to be true. But even at 15, I didn't scare so easily. But this was an entirely different kind of fear, one of which I've never encountered when faced with another human being. The best way I can describe it is the primal fear you get when seeing a predatory animal in the wild, I would compare it to being confronted by a black bear on a camping trail. 
At the moment, I didn't know why I felt the way I did. All I was focused on was these figures as they flawlessly and seamlessly maneuvered through the group of people, never once bumping or brushing up against any of them. It was like these folks didn't even acknowledge that they were even there. When the family finally got into the cars, I was able to get a better look at these figures. They appeared to be a man and a woman in their early to mid-twenties. They were almost perfect complements to each other. Both were Caucasian. The man was tall, light build, and had very light brown curly hair. He donned a pair of sunglasses, an overcoat, fingerless gloves, tactical boots, and what looked like a three-piece suit with a neon green tie underneath his overcoat. The woman was short and curvy. She had very dark, straight brown hair that had been placed into a bun. She was dressed as if she was attending a funeral. A dark gray skirt beneath a black overcoat. She wore a pair of heels and aviator sunglasses. At the time, I thought they looked a bit ridiculous, almost like they were cosplaying Matrix characters. However, I couldn't shake this fight-or-flight response I was having. These two were giving off some bad vibes as they methodically made their way right toward me. I must stress that they did not move naturally. They never flinched or turned their heads, slowed down, or changed direction. They looked almost robotic. I quickly jumped behind a nearby tree to hide. I peeked through some leaves so I could see, as they continued walking in my direction. As they approached, I ducked down again. I was afraid that they had spotted me and I thought about how awkward it would be if they saw some teenager hiding behind a tree as they passed. However, they went by without so much as a glance. I'll point out that the woman had heels on, yet she maintained the same walking speed. I'm no expert on heels, but I know that walking through a forest onto a dirt road isn't exactly ideal. They didn't seem to notice me, but I waited a bit longer so that they can make their way further down the road before I made a break for it. After a couple of seconds, I hopped out of my hiding spot and began speed walking up the trail away from the strange couple. I could see them continuing to walk down the road. Three seconds later, I made it to where the dirt road became concrete and I decided to look back one last time. The couple had vanished. I last saw them walking by a fire hydrant, just off the path. Remember this detail for later. I wasn't sticking around to see if they would turn back up, so I continued to speed walk back home. During my walk home, the fear faded quickly, and by the time I made it to my house, I had completely forgotten about the whole thing. Little did I know... This was only a precursor of what was to come, only a few weeks later. In July of 2014, my mom signed me up for a birdwatching class. I had to wake up at 5 in the morning, catch a ferry to a nearby island, and spend the day setting up cameras. I know this may sound like a bummer, but I actually enjoyed it. However, by the time I got back to Long Island, which was around the afternoon, I was exhausted. On the day in question, I exited the ferry and began walking back to my house. When I got to the top of my street, I was about to cross when I noticed a khaki-colored car driving toward me. I turned my head to the right to meet the driver's glance. Everything seemed to stop in that brief moment when our eyes met. It was almost like something out of a movie. I can't recall any facial features, as he was in a moving car, and I didn't think anything of it after it happened. I just crossed the street and continued walking as normal. I did notice that the car had an American flag bumper sticker. As I walked down my road, I heard a commotion in the distance. At 
It happened about a block up the road. As I made my way further down, I noticed all the neighbors on my block making their way outside. One of them was wearing nothing but his underwear. A boat that was set atop a trailer had tipped over and fallen onto its side. It was now lying on the road. I thought maybe it wasn't secured properly, but as I got closer, I started getting worried that the boat may have fallen onto someone. It belonged to my neighbor across the street from my house, so while my other neighbors gathered by the fallen boat, I looked to the other side and saw my parents' minivan was pushed all the way up to the sidewalk and had heavy damage to the driver's side door. I was confused about what had just transpired, and by the looks of everyone outside, they all seemed to be just as perplexed. A few people witnessed what happened. Someone had crashed into my neighbor's boat and then swerved into my parents' van before speeding off down the street. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. My dad was outside and explained the noise sounded like a plane had just crashed. My mom soon came home from work. After seeing what was done to our van, she said that during her ride home, she said that she saw a car crashed into the fire hydrant on the dirt road, the same dirt road I mentioned in part one, but the driver was nowhere to be found. It was most likely a drunk, and the cops were already on scene. Since I had thorough knowledge of the area, and at the time I wanted to be a police detective, I decided to walk down there and tell the police about the layout of the forest and where he could have possibly gone to. No one had been hurt, but this driver was responsible for the damage to my neighbor's boat and my parents' minivan, and he had just driven off hoping that he didn't have to take responsibility. When I got there, I informed the officers on scene that if he had gone into the forest, he could be at the abandoned train station or a gated community that was near the forest. If he had gone straight through the woods, he may have ended up on the campgrounds. Beyond the camps were many ponds and reeds, and he would have been stuck with nowhere to go. They quickly assured me that the canine units would be arriving soon, and that they didn't need some teenager's help. I went home confident that they would find the man, and when I got there, our neighbor across the street had told my parents she saw the driver clear as day. He was a Hispanic male, with long black hair, wearing a white t-shirt. My dad and I then drove around our neighborhood, just in case the guy slipped to the police. Unfortunately, we didn't see the man after an hour of driving around. At this point, I was exhausted, but I decided to walk down the street to the dirt road one last time before calling in a night. When I got there, I saw that there were four police officers, all with their backs turned in the same direction, still looking at the vehicle. I was about to shout and ask them if they had found anything yet. That's when I see a man emerging from the woods, about 30 yards away from them. This man matched my neighbor's description perfectly. I stood there, stunned. I thought the police would turn around and see him, but none of them moved an inch. The man in the white shirt didn't seem to be sneaking around, and he didn't seem to be intoxicated either. He was walking perfectly calm, with a slight grin on his face. I didn't want to call out to the police, because I wasn't 100% sure if this was him. I was hoping that the cops would turn around, but they didn't, and the man just casually kept strolling away. I had no way of knowing if he had already talked to the police, and that's why he wasn't making an effort to conceal himself or running away, but I decided to tail him anyway. I followed him to the street adjacent to mine, but then he suddenly turned onto the road that I lived on. He then stopped and turned around, catching me off guard. He looked me dead in the eye for a few moments, but again, he did not run away. Trying to rationalize things, I thought maybe he was questioned by the police and wanted to check out the scene of the accident for himself. We eventually approached my house, 
By now, the wrecked van had been moved back into our driveway. Despite the damage, it still worked, and my neighbor's boat had been placed back on the trailer as if nothing had happened. The man casually walked right by my house. Since I had been following him, he never stumbled or showed any signs of being intoxicated. As we were just about to pass by my house, I thought maybe I should go and tell my parents, but I didn't want to lose sight of him. He already knew that I was following him. That's when my front door swung open, and my mom and dad both shouted my name. They were in the living room and saw the man walking by, which raised their suspicions since he matched our neighbor's description. They then saw me trailing him from behind with a very serious look on my face, which I didn't know I was making at the time. Well, I guess the cat's out of the bag now. Hey, I think this is the guy. I saw him coming out of the woods near where the car was wrecked. Again, I wasn't 100% sure. I didn't want to falsely accuse anybody. After telling my parents everything, I looked back to the street to see that he was already two blocks away. Almost at the end. Suddenly, one of the cops from earlier drove up our street. We flagged him down, and I told him that I thought the man walking down the road might have been the guy who damaged our van. The cops sped away, and we were able to see what unfolded from our driveway. The man was quickly surrounded by three other cops, and they handcuffed him on the spot. I no longer felt tired and I ran up the road to get a better look. The police had him sitting on the curb. They eventually stood him up and loaded him into the back of one of the cruisers. As they did that, the man was staring daggers at me, still grinning. I told the police how I trailed him from the crashed car, and they just laughed and said, they always return to the scene of the crime. I wasn't amused, because of how much of a lack of help they were. I mean, the guy walked right behind them. They didn't even know it. He probably would have gotten away if I hadn't been there. It turns out that the man was an illegal immigrant from Mexico, and had no insurance to cover the damage he caused by his reckless driving. So my family, nor my neighbors, got any kind of compensation. Last I heard... He was deported in September of that year to face a trial in Mexico, but I don't know what became of said trial, or if it even took place at all. My dad also told me he was way over the legal limit, and was surprised that the man could even stand, let alone walk. He was obviously in no condition to operate a vehicle. Maybe some people are better at handling their alcohol than others, but at no point when I saw him driving or walking away, would I have ever suspected that this man was drunk? It was almost like he did these things on purpose. The date of writing this is June 14th, 2023. It's been nearly nine years since that day, yet I still have a lot of unanswered questions. I don't ponder them often, but every now and again... They'll come up. For starters, where did that strange couple disappear to? How did they maneuver through that large group of people so seamlessly? And why did I feel so afraid of them when they were approaching me? In regards to the man who effectively destroyed my family's minivan and damaged my neighbor's boat, why didn't the cops bring in the canine unit like they said they were going to? How did they not see the suspect walking out of the woods when the four of them were standing right there. You can chalk it up to the police incompetence, but something just feels off about this entire thing. Why did the apparently drunk driver not seem intoxicated whatsoever? I'm from Long Island, and I know a drunk person when I see one. Does anybody else think it's an odd coincidence that both the pseudo couple and the driver disappeared around the same area, near the fire hydrant on the dirt road. You may be asking yourself, well, how is the strange couple wearing the suits connected to the drunk driver that crashed into the fire hydrant? 
About a year after these occurrences, I was watching videos relating to the men in black. People claimed to have encountered strange men, typically dressed in black suits, after they encountered UFOs, or have been involved in top-secret government affairs, even indirectly or accidentally. There was a presentation of an older French lady describing her experience with a strange man while riding a train in Paris. According to her, the man was wearing an all-black suit and hat. She also described an unnerving aura that made her feel like she was in danger. She said that she was the only person on the train who noticed this man. Some people even walked very close to him when getting on and off the train. It was almost as if he wasn't even there. Later that day, she boarded the same train and was involved in a major accident. Multiple people died, but she managed to escape with a broken arm. Many elements of this woman's account sounded similar to mine. Every personal account I've heard on YouTube explains how these men in black are unnerving and inhuman. Some people believe that they're from a U.S. government agency. Some say that they're a part of a now-defunct branch of operatives that was called Majestic 12, which dealt with UFOs and other inexplicable phenomenon. Some say that they're aliens or time travelers, and some say that they are a bad omen. They may or may not oppose a direct threat, but an event that could result in death may happen shortly after their appearance. That's why I'm sharing this story. If things had played out differently that day on the street, I could have easily been plowed into by that drunk driver. The boat could have fallen onto someone walking by, and my dad could have been in the minivan and got rammed into. I want to warn everyone listening that if you see a strange person dressed in all black attire, and they make you feel like you're about to be suspended over an open nuclear reactor, which is to say they make you feel very uncomfortable, you have to be on your guard, even after they presumably vanish. Hey everyone, this is your Uncle Unit. Thank you so much for checking out my video. If you have a story that you would like me to narrate on this channel, please send it to my email, unit522submit at gmail.com. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future content. And if you would like to support this channel even further, you can check out my merch store. There's a link for that in the description. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you stay tuned for the next video. Until then, never forget.